Hi everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Venetia and this is the Woolly Worker Knitting Podcast and this is episode 7 today. I'm as always really excited to be filming today. It's only been about two weeks since I filmed the last podcast but somehow a lot has happened and I have so much to talk about so I'm really going to try and keep it short and sweet in terms of introductions but really quickly if you're new here then Hello, I'm really glad that you're checking me out. This is a knitting podcast channel, but I also put other related videos like pattern roundups. I just recently posted one about 10 t-shirts to knit this spring, if you want to check that out, or if you're coming from there, then hi, welcome to uh, the channel. And I created this channel back in January to try and document my knitting and connect with the knitting community and it's been really great so far. You can find me on Instagram and Ravelry also at The Woolly Worker and here I try and post a bit more um, updates on my projects and in the stories I put some polls sometimes like choosing buttons or choosing thumbnails for the videos which is always really helpful when you guys vote on those. Uh, and another important thing to mention is that I always put every single detail of what I'm talking about in the description and if not then you can always ask me and I'm really quick to answer. I put things like the yarn colors, the pattern names, the designers and on Ravelry I always put like the size, the yardages and any modifications that I make to the patterns and I always try and discuss those in the podcast as well. Today's episode is also very special because I will be announcing the giveaway winner for uh, one free pattern and also for this beautiful kind of hand dyed yarn. Uh, if you didn't know, I hosted a giveaway last episode two weeks ago to celebrate my um, milestone about subscribers and also my first festival of wool who kindly donated this kind of yarn to give away to one of my subscribers. So uh, we'll be announcing that at the end, but there's always going to be chapters and timestamps in the description box that you can click ahead if you want to skip some parts. I usually follow the same format as most podcasters. I'll talk about what I'm wearing, my finished objects, there's five to talk about today, and then my works in progress, of which there are also five, and then I'll talk about maybe some swatches or some future knitting plans, and there's a couple of those as well. And acquisitions, but I'll try not to be too chatty about these because I feel like a lot of people that just like prefer uh, the act actual knitting chat. Excitingly, there will be some crochet talk about today, but again, if you want to skip that, you can go in the description and click ahead. So yeah, it's about um, 6 p.m. today. Like I said before, it's really nice to be able to film even though it's late and we're still getting some natural light. So my mind is a little bit frazzled from having <laughs> worked. So I hope that I'm not too rambly and that this is enjoyable for you. I hope that you can get some knitting done while you're watching. Like I said, that's probably going to be a long episode. So like a solid hour of knitting is what you might get during this time. And yeah, I hope that you find this episode enjoyable. So first things first, I will talk about what I am wearing and you might recognize this. This is the April Cardigan by Petite Knit. Um, so I'll stand up a little bit. I'm wearing joggers, so let's just, let's just face it. So yeah, this is a nice very comfy cardigan. It's got a saddle shoulder construction, which is like very nice about this design. And otherwise it's a raglan. It's got four buttons. Uh, and I made this in Drops Flora in beige and Filcola Natilia in chai. And I'll put the colors below. And I've talked about this project quite a lot in the previous episode. Uh, back then I was basically doing the button band, the red button band. I was just like five rows from casting off. So I'll really not go into too much detail about that, but I'll be putting some shots. Uh, I went out today with my boyfriend to take some nice, like finished object photos and videos. So those will be on screen as I'm speaking about this project. I finished the button band. I did two setup rounds of double knitting before the tubular bind off. And for that, I was a bit nervous because, you know, let's pretend that there's like 400 stitches all around to pick up and to bind off, which is a huge amount. So I was faced with the choice of whether to do it with just the flora or the flora with the mohair and whether to do it in one go or to purposefully separate the cardigan in half and bind off the first half, then join new yarn and bind off the second half. Uh, so what I ended up doing was basically estimating enough yarn with both strands to try and do half but that actually took me all the way up to like a solid three quarter then I had to join new yarn and I bound off the rest and it was okay and I just 
weaved in the ends afterwards and it doesn't seem like there's any gaps or anything. So I would recommend doing that in the future. If you're nervous about too many like Italian stitches to bind off, then just do it in sections. And I didn't have that many problems with the mohair. I know some people can find it really tricky and it like tangles into itself. I found it okay, but maybe I'm just really used to doing the tubular bind off with mohair. So it was fine. Then the buttons, uh, you can see in the photos, I chose those like wooden ones that I just bought from Wool Warehouse. They might be from the brand like Drops. Uh, they were just really cheap. I think it was 25p per button. And I don't have a huge button stash. Like usually I buy buttons for a project and then I use them for that. Saying that I haven't made that many cardigans. I've only made two so far. But I had a little bit of buttons in the stash and I was faced with a big dilemma of which ones to use. I put it on a poll on my Instagram and a lot of people wanted to, me to use the tortoise shell but I was really feeling those wooden ones and I'm really happy I went with that. I feel like it just gives a very cozy vibe. Like it just, I just, I, I almost wish it had pockets, you know, but I quite like this classy look and you'll see in the photos, it looks great buttoned, unbuttoned. So yeah, this is an absolute uh, victory of a project. I'm super happy with it. It was really fast to do like, uh, I think I said last time, like basically two weeks. Uh, super enjoyable and addictive to do the yolk increases and surprisingly very comfy like even with mohair I know a lot of people are not like loving mohair I had bought like drops kit silk at first but I changed my mind and I'm happy I went for Tilia it's more expensive but I tolerate it more and here wearing this with just like a t-shirt it really doesn't itch my arms or anything or my skin because it's a v-neck as well it doesn't touch my neck so the only place I'm feeling this mohair I guess are the wrists and I love the fit of the sleeves they're kind of like they're quite tapered but it's it's that comfortable that I'm going to be wearing it basically until I go to bed tonight like it's a perfect layering piece where I'm not too warm but also not cold so yeah love this cardigan 100% will make another like the pattern I find it, it fits me so so well I would do it again 100% and I wouldn't do any mods maybe just like not a, a mohair free version but I could see myself making one in a more colorful version, like for, for summer. But I, I like this one, it's like a darker beige, which I think suits me better than uh, very beige. The cost of the April cardigan is um, here, written on screen, which I think it was made affordable because of the flora, and then it was made a bit more pricey because of the uh, mohair from Phil Kalana. But I'm really happy I went with that. I could have made it with a drops kit silk, but I think it would have been way less comfortable for me personally. And for buttons, by the way, I should mention, I use a trick that I did as well for the um, champagne cardigan. I'll try and put a video here of like the close-up, but basically what you do is you create a gap between the button and the button band so that when you're buttoning up the cardigan, the button has a, like, there's room under the button for the other button band to rest. So I hope that the video shows it when I'm putting it next to me. I didn't invent this trick, I just saw it on Instagram or YouTube and I just thought it was a genius way and I think it really helps to make the buttons lay flat and hopefully it's also good to make them more sturdy so we'll see in the future if that paid off. But okay, I think it's time to move on to the next finished item and it's another um, big one, it's the Dartmoor sweater by Kadri. I had started this on the last episode, I had made a swatch. This is one I'm using Phil Kalana Peruvian Highland Wool in charcoal, held with Phil Kalana Alva in black. And I'm not quite meeting gauge. The gauge, I think, is 15 stitches. And I'm at 16, so I calculated what I had to do. And basically, if I wanted a size extra small or small, which is what I wanted, I should make a size medium and follow those stitch counts. And then lengthwise, I would follow the length of size XS or S. And I feel quite comfortable now doing those kind of adjustments, gauge-wise and size-wise, and it pays off a lot of the time. I didn't want to make it with mohair, I wanted it to be like the softest, comfiest thing ever. And that also worked up really quickly, I think it just took about two weeks. So it'll be showing photos again on screen, but I'll show it to you as well here. It is quite heavy, I must say. So I don't know exactly how much wear I'm going to get this season. Uh, it was de It's definitely warm, but not like overly so. And it's really gorgeous and it's really comfy. I love the oversized like sleeves and the drop shoulder. I'm really enjoying drop shoulders. I think it just fits me in like my comfy style a lot and like they're not as fitted. 
So yeah, I'm so happy with my color choice. I think basically it's marling, which is super trendy at the moment. Um, and yeah, like a low contrast marling, I think is really great to give some dimension and depth to a fabric. Like it almost looks like a hand dyed, like charcoal yarn, but it's just the Alva, the black Alva doing some like shading work in the background. And the flagship thing about this sweater as well is the I-cord edging detail, which you can't really see that much. And to be fair, I think a lot of it has blocked out. Like when I blocked it, it flattened, but that's okay. Um, I'm not too mad. If I did it again, I might do the I-cord in a larger size needle, so it's not that tight. But it's super comfy to wear. Before I blocked it, when I put it on, I found that I could almost feel the I-cord being tight at the back. But after blocking, I didn't notice that at all whatsoever. I was worried the sleeves were gonna grow too much, so I made sure when I was blocking to like widen them instead of lengthen them. And I was really careful not to like pick this up when it was wet because the weight of itself would be pulling down on it so much. But yeah, I can really foresee myself wearing this sweater so, so much in winter and autumn next year because it's a good length as well that if I'm wearing joggers or leggings, like it covers my butt and it's next to skin soft. There's nothing to say about that. I love the pattern. The pattern was a breeze. It was so simple. It was so clear. There were a couple of videos that explained like the tricky parts. I would do it again. I think I really might. It was it was so fast because you're working with like large needles. I think I did mine on five millimeter needles and I might make it in a like statement color, like a petrol blue or like a dark green or a navy. Uh, I probably would use the same yarn again, like Alva. They have quite a lot of nice colors, like either neutrals or um, bright colors. Someone made it in an electric blue, which is really, really gorgeous. Or I could do it in like a gray. Or you could do it with brushed alpaca as well, if you're not a fan of mohair. Like you could get some cheap drops brushed alpaca in white and make a very like nice, fluffy, cozy cloud jumper. So yeah, the Dartmoor is also 100% a success and a victory and I love it. The total cost of the Dartmoor will be put here below. I always try and put the price of my knits in those videos. I think it's important, I guess, to talk about it or to be aware because sometimes you just feel like you're buying yarn but you don't really know like where it goes or how you're using it and just as well to keep to keep in mind the fact that like just because I'm making my own clothes doesn't mean that they don't cost anything. So I just like to keep track of those things for myself anyway, but a lot of you guys have said that you enjoy me putting it on screen as well. Uh, also to note that sometimes, a lot of the times, I buy my yarn on sale, so if the prices don't seem to match what you might find in the UK, it might be because I, I had gotten it for cheaper elsewhere. But um, also, all of the yarn that I always talk about, I bought myself. I've never received any free yarn, except for that giveaways kind that I'm giving away. But everything else is purchased with my own money, and if that changes ever, then I would tell you. <laughs> so those were the two big knits that I finished since the last episode. Then there's another big knit that I finished that I'm super proud of. And this is the Burra Cowl. I finally finished it. I originally gave myself the goal to like knit 10 rounds a day so I could try and finish it within the week. And then on the first day I did 10, on the second day I did 15, and on the third day I just finished it. So it was a good strategy, like reverse psychology almost. And um, I blocked it. I weaved in the ends blocked it and then sewn it together with Kitchener stitch. So it's really flat and it's really nice. Um, there's normally supposed to be four repeats, but I only made three and I think that works perfectly because otherwise it would just be like super droopy. I'll try and again share some photos on screen so you can see what it looks like when I'm wearing it. I do find that it's quite tall, you know. So what I think I might do when I wear this in the future is like fold it first and then put it on. I think that it looks really really cool and it'll be so warm because there's like what like eight layers of fabric at the thickest points when I'm doing this. But I think this is a work of art, like I think this is just an absolute dream. The fabric it creates is so squishy. The Jameson of Shetland Spindrift blooms incredibly well when it like washes out and blocks. 
The stitches have evened out and the color work is like really neat. At first I was worried because I had started out and I was a bit loose. So it was nine inches wide and towards the end it was eight inches wide. But even that sort of evened out with blocking. And then when I, when I sewed it together with a Kitchener stitch, you really can't tell that one side is like thicker than the other. I'm trying to find my Kitchener graft so I can show you. I think it's here because I left my tail. It's the last thing I have to do. But I... Yeah. L let me know first, actually. Can you tell where I Kitchener stitched? It is here. The row of dark grey, just above the blue diamonds. So, I think I did a pretty good job. It's a tiny bit tighter, the Kitchener stitch, but... That's okay. I think it's like it doesn't cinch in or anything. Like it's just stays perfect. So yeah, I absolutely love my burra cowl. The colors are very spring-like, but obviously it's going to be a very warm accessory. I can't wait to wear it with my beige coat. I think it's like the perfect pop of color. I only modified two colors, but I talked about that in my previous video, and it was just because I didn't have access to the ones that Mary Wallen recommended. But it doesn't make a difference because it's basically the same green and the same yellow. Uh, so I would, I would trust Mari Wallen for her color palette. I wouldn't substitute any colors. An interesting point that I think Mel Makes Stuff talks about when you're thinking about color work, like Fair Isle patterns, is when you're looking at it, you kind of have to try and see what color is dominant. Because here there's 12 colors that are used, but like there's literally three lines of yellow per uh, chart repeat. So you can't see the yellow at all. Like for example, the yellow here is um, like one line here in the blue band, highlight band. So when I hold this like this, what color would you say is dominant? For me, it's 100% that pink and then that green. And then maybe that like red, the paprika color, or also that like orange, burnt umber. So if I substituted something, it might be the pink but keep in mind that if you substitute that, it's going to be as vibrant as that pink is, or like as dominant. Or if you're making your swatch, make sure that you're replacing a dominant color with another dominant color and vice versa. So I hope that makes sense. But just like when you're looking at this, you have to think about what colors matter more than the others. I don't think there's anything else to say about this. I'll put the cost below. Uh, the way that I calculate my cost is that I calculate by yardage and then by price of skein. So if I'm using half a skein, I'm putting the, the cost of half a skein because in my mind, I'm, I'm going to use that half skein for something else later and I don't want to count it twice. And I know other people might do it differently, but that's just how I do it. So here, for example, that entire cowl took about four and a half skeins of yarn altogether, but I had to buy like almost like 11 or 12. I think it's 11 colors and I had two in, in stash. So I bought nine balls of yarn, used 11 colors, but only use four and a half like skeins worth of yardage for this cowl. But a lot of her other patterns in the book, it's from like the Shetland collection, they rep rep like reprise those colors, like the paprika, the sunset, um, fog, and like blue love it. Like all of those colors are being reused later. So if I were to remake one of the patterns from the book of Mary Wallen, I would 100% like reuse those colors that I still have in stash. Some of the colors I barely dipped into. Something else to mention was the, like, uh, not the float management, the ends management. I found it really difficult to know what to do with my ends. I could carry them up some rounds, but then it was really difficult because I was working with like five, seven different kinds of wool on the table, which was not ideal. So then I tried something else where I was just cutting all the yarns when I wasn't using them, unless I was carrying them just over three rounds maximum. But then by doing that, I had a lot of ends because as you can see, you're changing um, the colors a, a lot in the pattern. And then when I was weaving the ends, I just tied them together and then wove them a few times. But then I realized that that was leaving me a big ridge and I'll put the photo on screen of what it looked like and I was really unhappy with that. I thought it looked so bulky. But then when I blocked it, that got better. So it gave me the confidence to keep going with that uh, technique of weaving in the ends. And anyway, that end is going to be like here on the side, on, on the edge. You could also put it on the inside because you won't see that. So I guess I can always change that later. It's not like I have to make a decision on, on where I'm putting my edge. 
But I'll show you here what my edge is like. So the beginning of round. You can't really see actually, can you? It's in the center of that like diamond. That's the beginning of round. So yeah, really, really happy with this. I can't wait to wear it in, in winter. I feel really proud of that, of having made this. I made it on, I want to say 3.25 millimeter needles, on three millimeter needles. And it took me a month, like on and off, but basically, yeah, a month since I cast it on. So yeah, super happy, uh, a success. I probably wouldn't make it again because why would I? I already have one. But I'll definitely make more like Mary Wallen designs for sure. I want to make a cardigan and a sweater from her and maybe a vest. Maybe not like the accessories like the gloves and the scarves. Maybe another cowl if she has any. But yeah, loved, loved it. And I find the Jameson quite soft as well. Like it's definitely like it's Shetland wool. So it's rustic but it softens up so much after like blocking and also with wear so i have mittens made of the jameson and i love it i have another cowl made of jameson which i wear all like i would wear all the time in winter so this is making me wonder where, whether like i could go for a sweater i think i would definitely be fine with a sweater of jameson's so that's good to know the last thing to mention about that is that i found it quite difficult to I, I, the only modification that I did was that Mary Wallen has you just cast on and then join in like in the round, do the tube, cast off and then graft together. But I wanted an invisible seam. So I did a provisional cast on with a crochet chain. Then I knit the tube and then I didn't bind off. I left the stitches live. And then I went back to my provisional cast on. You unzip the crochet chain and you put them back on the needle and then that way you're set up for Kitchener, like, grafting of a tube, which, by the way, is just, like, one big sock. I was a bit confused at first having to graft two ends of a tube, because then I had, like, four needles. But you're still only working with two needles at the same time. And I put a link in my Ravelry of the tutorial that I used to kind of visualize how to graft in the round and also how to have that invisible, like, join at the, at the end. So that was really useful. But I found it difficult to pick up my stitches from my provisional cast on because I had done a technique where when you join in the round you join you cast on one extra stitch and you pass that one over and that gives you like a, a good tight join in the round so I did that and then I realized that that was going to be very tricky to pick up the stitches afterwards because as well when you're picking up the stitches on the other side um, everything is half a stitch off so if that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry, because it made no sense to me either as I was doing it. So that was not too enjoyable. And I was leaving the grafting until the very last minute, but then I decided, like, the project is not finished until you graft it. So you can't call it an FO if you haven't uh, grafted it together. And I'm really glad that I sat down and did it. It didn't take too, too long in the end. It was okay. And that also the buttons, I sewed them on today. <laughs> so I'm really bad at leaving things until the last minute, like the finishing touches, but it's so satisfying once it's like really, really finished. I've been better at blocking my things straight away and also weaving in the ends straight away, but buttons are still like my nemesis. <laughs> okay, the next thing that I finished is a crochet item and it was just the pure impulse uh, cast on. Do you cast on a crochet? You chain, you make it, you make it. Mm. Anyway, I've made a little Amigurumi Snorlax. Look at how massive he is. He's an absolute unit. I love him so much. He's like so squishy but like really firm as well. He's self-standing because it was it was a really it was a pain to try and like get the oh sorry you can see the stuff in here. It was a pain to get the legs to be like basically aligning with his butt so that he'd be like a tripod but like it works. Um, I'm quite pleased with how symmetrical he is. It's always so tricky. Like, that's my thing about this pattern. It was a free pattern. The pattern was great in terms of, like, the instructions for, like, the pieces. But then sewing the things together was just, like, sew the thing together. And it's like, where? Some patterns, like, paid for, they're usually, like, more precise about where exactly they want you to put, like, the pieces. Which is always, like, very appreciated. But that one was just, like, you're on your own. But anyway, I think I, I made it very symmetrical. The face is embroidered, just like literally three straight lines. Um, so you make the blue part first, 
then you attach the arms, then you attach the ears and the legs, and then you can attach like that uh, cream. I used acrylic yarn I had in the stash for like back in my crochet days. The little guy himself took a few days of crocheting and then the motivation to like stuff it and put it all together, sew it together, that took a few more days. But I think it was a week overall for the whole project. I'm just working on that on evenings. He's so cute! I don't think I want to make any more soon, like other Pokemon. I love Pokemon by the way. It's like my other hobby. Um, I don't know if I want to make other ones because like just every Pokemon, if you know, like they have very interesting shapes and like design features and body parts. I just can't be bothered. So unless I'm making a Pokemon that is as round as this one, like Jigglypuff, um, I don't think I'll be making any other ones. But I'm, I'm happy I have him. He's like my best friend. I keep him around. Like usually I just put him over there. So yeah, there was a, a nice little project. I'd highly recommend people to take up crochet so they can uh, crochet some friends. Okay, the last finished item, do you believe it or not, is my lento. I finished it. I think I finished it yesterday. I just decided... I made an order on Wool Warehouse a couple of weeks ago and I thought it would be a good time to get that last kind of drops brushed alpaca that like I had run out of yarn halfway through my lento which is why I didn't finish it during the knit along. So I decided to leave it and just I'll buy the yarn when I do an order. And then I made an order so I thought cool I'll buy the yarn. And yesterday I decided you know what I'm in a very spring cleany mood. I'm getting things off the needles like the April, the Dartmoor. Why not clear off the lento as well, especially because I'm going to start needing those cables that it was on. It was on like the Chai Ogu set, the needles I use. They have cables for needles under 5mm and then they have cables for above 5mm. The lento is using the cable for above 5 because I made it on a 5.5 and I'm going to make a project that uses that needle soon. So I was like, okay, get the lento done. And it literally took like two hours. I had one sleeve to finish and then like, like five centimeters of the body, then it was done. So I made quite a lot of modifications. First of all, I don't have the project here because it's blocking right now, but I'll be putting some shots because this weekend it'll be fine. This is Friday today. I think on Sunday I'm gonna try and get some videos and footage and photos of the lento, but I can talk about it. As I said, I made quite a lot of modifications, but first things first, I started this lento back in January for the knit along organized by Rebecca of the Crevea and Amy Palco of the Meaningful Stitch. If you've been on knitting YouTube or Instagram, like you are aware that there was a um, knit along going on. Everybody made one. It was a really great opportunity to try things out because the pattern is really easy. It's a raglan, top down raglan with a big gauge cropped that doesn't use, use much yarn. So people could use up their fancy yarns, fancy skeins. They could make like different increase details. They could do textures. They could moral things. So that's what I did. I went with a combination of a rust alpaca color and a gray brushed alpaca color, which gave this like rusty boat kind of vibe, which I wasn't sure of with the swatch. But then as I cast it on the neck and everything, I, I thought, okay, that's fine. And then I lost confidence again, but then I gained it back. Like it was a whole whirlwind of what am I doing? What is this working? But it, it was working. It is working. I'm happy with it. My boyfriend really likes it. For some reason, he's really into that like rusty color. So I made a lot of modifications. The first thing is that the increases, I think, are like make one, like knit front back, but I made mine make one right and make one left because I just like the look of that better. It shows off like the raglan stitch better, I think. Then I lengthened it a little bit. I made the sleeves, balloon sleeves ish by not doing any decreases after I picked them up. Then I did one rapid decrease round and then I did an I-cord bind off. And I put all the length details and like measurements on my Ravelry, but the sleeves are like basically like three quarter like this, I think, or like a bit longer. They, they might have grown with the wash actually. But I really, really like the fit of the sleeves. It, it just, it was an experiment. I wasn't sure, but I love, I love that. I love that I did that. And then the body, I also bound off with an eye cord and I actually did something, again, out of the comfort zone. I added some short rows at the back. There are none. Uh, there's some at the back neck, which I did. But I added some at the back hem 
to make the back like dip a bit lower than the front. So the front would be like here and then the back would be like lower. And that's because it was quite cropped. So I wanted like a bit more coverage, especially if I'm like moving around and like doing things. And I will put, I put a link on my Ravelry of the kind of instructions I followed because basically you have to figure out how much length you want to add at the back. And I wanted one inch. And that would be six rounds, basically, of like knitting. And then you have to see where you want your short rows like to hit, like how many stitches you're working with. So for example, if you're doing your short if you're having your short rows end like exactly at the arm seams, then you would have half of your body stitches. But I made mine come a bit like more towards the front. So basically I had like, I don't know, like 60%, 55% of the body stitches. And basically you divide that by your number of rounds. So let's say that I had 60 stitches to work with and I want to make them, my short rows, over six rounds. You divide 60 by six, so that's 10. So you want your short rows to be spaced 10 stitches apart. And that's how the website explained it. And it made sense to me. And I was like, you know what, again, nothing to lose. I really don't have like, a problem with ripping this back and like not doing short rows it's literally the end of the project it's not like I would notice later that something bothered me so then I did them and I was really happy with it and then I made one more round of like resolving my short rows then I did the eye cord bind off and yeah super happy with having done that it boosted my confidence about being able to modify patterns and like adding those design elements that are not in the pattern but that I picked up from other patterns I did that for my um Loom Sweater by Sari Nordland. She had instructions on how to do short rounds for the hem. This project was extremely cost effective. I'll put here below how much it cost. It could have been less if I had made the sleeves not balloony because obviously that took more. So that's why I ran out of alpaca, like the brushed alpaca. But it could have been cheaper if I didn't need to buy that extra one. So I will make the lento again. I already have the yarn for it. I'll show a photo of it here. It's a yarn from an indie dyer here in Scotland, Giddy Yarns. And I was originally gonna make another one with brushed alpaca, but I'm thinking now I want to marl it. And I think what I will do is hold one strand of that hand dyed and one strand of like white fingering weight because it would go well with the colorway of that hand dyed yarn. And then swatch with that and see what fabric that gives me. I hope it doesn't wash out too much the hand dyed. It might make it a bit more subdued, which like would be nice. I just don't want to have the brushed alpaca like completely fuzz out the special like special factor of that hand dyed yarn. But it won't be for any time soon because I usually don't make patterns twice. So if I'm gonna do that, I need to have a lot of time between them. Uh, right now, Rebecca is testing her Tolsta T pattern. She's saying that testers are making like four or five versions of them. And it's like, that's insane. Like in a row, I would never, I don't think I've ever loved the pattern so much that I'd want to make it twice in a row. But if it's a gauge that lets you knit it up really fast, then maybe that, that seems like a, a, a feasible thing. The last modification I, I did to that lento was I made a pearl seam like on the side of the body and also at the, at the bottom of the sleeve, which is something I wanted to try again, to see if it's something I could incorporate in other sweaters in the future. And I like it. It's not that visible, to be honest. It wasn't a hassle. You literally just like split the body in half, like do the math and then separate that stitch out with stitch markers to remember. Or if you're like really good at visual, like visually seeing it and remembering to like pearl that one, then just do that. Um, so yeah, I don't know if it was worth the hassle because you, you really can't see it that much. I kind of like the effect it has on the wrong side because you get like reverse stockinette and you get that big knit stitch on the on the back. So I like that. I think it's a design element of a few of um, Andrea Maori's patterns that like slip stitches like in, in onto reverse stockinette. But yeah, I'm really happy to have finished the lento. It was bothering me that I didn't finish it. It was just like hanging with my other sweaters, like unfinished with strands running about. So it's good to have closed that page. Okay, so I think that's all for my finished item. So now let's talk about my works in progress. And the first one I will talk about is something that I've mentioned in my 
previous video, the 10 t-shirts I want to knit. I already had a yarn for a few of them and making that video and reading your comments inspired me to, to cast on one of them. So I've cast on the Palm Tea by Linnet and I've done it with Drops Bell. So here's the yarn, Bell. It's in like the petrol colorway. And here's the t-shirt so far. So I've started it yesterday. Yes, I've started it yesterday. And I've just made like the little like ribbing at the top and then it's like a lace yoke. So you can't see much. I doubt you can see. But basically you get like little like trenches and sections. It's a regular, it's a regular, it's a circular yoke. So the increase are just done like in that like circular manner. So you get all those little lace sections that get bigger and wider as they're going towards your body. It's quite addictive because you have some rounds of lace and then you have some rounds of stockinette. So every time you're doing lace, you're like, oh, I just want to like get to the next lace round of the chart. Uh, my gauge was a bit weird because of the yarn. The yarn is a cotton viscose and linen mix and it is the weirdest thing to get used to. I think I've gotten the like hang of it now, but my gauge swatch was super weird on the recommended needles. I think it was recommended to use four millimeters. So I've done a swatch with the 3.75 and I liked that better. I washed it and it shrunk a bit in the wash. Yeah, it shrunk in the wash. So again, I did my calculations with the gauge to figure out if for the ease I wanted, what stitch count should I follow? And to get the ease of the size small, I should follow the steps for the size extra small. So I've cast on the extra small size. I know that cotton behaves differently than like wool, so it has no memory. So once I wear it and stretch it, it will stay in that stretch and it won't bounce back, except if I block it. But when I block it, it will shrink. And then with wear, it will stretch out. So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, people say to try and use that yarn for garments you want a loose fit with. You don't want the stuff that's like hugging your curves because the cotton won't hug your curves. It will st get stretched out by your curves and then it won't hug them. It will like stay away from them is the way I understand that. Also blue cotton apparently is quite prone to like uh, bleeding and uh, like washing out. So I'll be careful not to put anything else in the like tub when I'm washing this. That's fine. Uh, I, I wasn't sure about the color. I had a, a big like overthinking moment where I thought maybe I wanted a gray version or like a white, like yeah, a gray version or a light blue version or a beige one. I wasn't sure the lace would show very well on this, but actually I'm quite happy I went with this because um, it's quite see-through, as you can tell. So I don't know if I would have been happy with a grey see-through thing. I don't know. The price of this was very cheap, I talked about before. So if I were to make another one, and I could make another one, like, I mean, I haven't done much yet, but from what I'm doing so far, I'm enjoying it. I could make another one and I could make it in grey, but I'm happy to just use up my stash. So it's good that I'm staying with what I had thought was a good idea once and trusting myself that I will like the final product. And I like blue. Blue is one of my favorite colors. So happy that I went with that pattern. There was something really funny where like I literally couldn't understand the first round of the chart because I think it may be something really like related to the instructions and the translations, but she says to like do a backward loop increase what she means is a, f a knit front back so don't be like me and, and overthink for two hours when she says backward loop increase she means knit front back uh, and I put information on my Ravelry as well about how I got around the issue because like basically the chart kind of makes sense but it doesn't course like the first run of the chart you have two increases and you have some stitches in the middle and then you're looking at your knitting and somehow the stitch count doesn't really match with that but if you're following the logic, which is like increase, increase, stitches in the middle, then it works out. So I hope that makes sense. If you're doing the pattern, if you didn't get like caught by anything, then maybe it was just me who wasn't understanding the chart. But apart from that first round of the chart, everything else has been smooth sailing. After the yoke is done, you separate for sleeves and you just knit down the body. So that'll be very easy peasy. And I'm excited to try the fit of that because usually circular yokes are a bit of a hit and miss. My row gauge is a tiny bit off, so I'll have to see when to split for sleeves, but there's always the option of like knitting up some stockinettes to bridge the gap.
So yeah, okay, the next project is a small one and I've just casted this on because I needed a little social knitting project because I'm, I've been meeting up with knitty friends quite a lot recently and I'm always like finishing sweaters and it's never the thing I want to bring to a knitting date. So I'll show you my project bag, by the way. This is what I carry my knitting in. So you may have seen this in my other video about the Scottish Wool Producer Showcase that I talked about in my previous podcast. This is yarn that is like from John Arben, sp spun by John Arben, but hand dyed by Nervous Fiber from Glasgow. And it's the colorway Buttered. And look at that amazing gold. It's so stunning. I'll put a photo of it like in the sunlight. And here's the project, and I'm making the Muscle Bra hat by Isolde Teague. You probably have heard of that pattern, like, already. Um, yeah, I'm using 3.25mm needles on that fingering weight yarn. It's a mix of a bunch of British breeds. It's the, like, Devonia 4-ply base. And I'm really, really happy I went with that at the show. There were quite a lot of colors, like there were some like muted ones and beige and grays. And then that one was just the one that was bringing the most like joy and wow factor. So I went for it and I'm glad I did. The muscle bra hat, you basically cast on. You don't have to do a gauge swatch. You cast on, do increases. When you have enough fabric, you measure your gauge then based on your gauge, you figure out, the pattern tells you how many more increases you have to do. Then when you reach that much increases for your size, you continue knitting down in a really long tube. And then you start doing decreases to mirror the increases. Then you fold it inside out, like inside itself. And then that makes a double layered thick hat. That's just like a, a, a mirror image of himself. It's a really popular pattern and for good reason. It's really good for like one single kind of special yarn. I'm glad I went for a tonal, but I know some people will go with speckled yarns. You can also do like the first half of the hat in one color and the second half in the other color. Then you have a reversible hat that's like looking different depending on how you wear it. If your increases are neater than your decreases, you can wear that side facing out and like vice versa. The cast on I used, there were a couple of different ways to do it and I used the method where uh, you crochet the first stitches. I think you have to cast on, like it, if you do crochet, it's basically magic loop, but it's a bit different with knitting. And I found that to be obviously the trickiest part of the hat. And after that, it was absolute smooth sailing. I'm happy with the fabric I'm getting. It's like maybe a, a tiny bit more holy than I would have gone for for a normal hat, but because it will be double like thickness and like folded in onto itself, then I don't mind that it's a bit like less dense fabric. So I'm happy with that choice. And if I don't use up all the yarn, I'm sure that this will be a lovely accent color for some like socks and color work. So I would 100% buy this yarn again, 100% would buy from Charlotte from uh, Nervous Fiber again. I absolutely love her palette and her style and her bases. She has a lot of special bases, like she's got some very luxurious alpaca silky cashmere ones that I'm dying to buy for a summer garment, like the ones I talked about in my like spring knit video. But I'm trying to use up my expensive yarn first before making another like extravagant indie dyer purchase, which is fair enough. So yeah, like I said, I am not rushing whatsoever to do this hat. In fact, I'm, I'm having to control myself not to work on it because I want to only work on it when I'm out and about and seeing friends, because that's like the easiest thing to carry with you. Um, so I'm just gonna work on it as and when I see people. So I guess when you see the, pro the progress on that next episode, you'll have a, an idea of my social life. Okay, what next? Uh, let's talk about crochet, there's one more thing. So very excitingly, my friend Sam from the Shugly Stitch said that she was entering the Royal, Royal Highland Showcase, like farm show that like is held in Edinburgh every year. They have a like arts and crafts sort of competition or like show. I'm gonna be terrible at explaining this, but yeah, you get a prompt, you get a deadline, you have to enter and then you can win. So she's doing it in a spinning capacity. She's spinning some Shetland grade lace yarn and I'm entering the crochet one. I would have entered the knitting, but the prompts really weren't speaking to me. And they were all like purple based. 
And I think purple is my least favorite color or pink because I literally don't have a single skin of purple in my stash, except for one that I'm going to show in like just a second. So the theme for the crochet was shades of blue. So I looked up on Ravelry for a crochet shawl. And then I saw a lot of people were doing it in sheepshies, like whirl and whirlet. They're like color, like gradient ones with matching single color skines. And I've made my Sophie's Universe in that before. And I really, really liked working with it. It's a really thin, like fingering weight, almost like crochet strand, but people knit with it as well. It's acrylic and cotton. And crocheting with that on a very thin crochet hook, I think I'm using, um, a three millimeter crochet hook then it gives you a very luxurious like almost knitted like fabric and tension as opposed to the bulky worsted weight crochet which i think i wouldn't enjoy doing anymore like the snorlax wasn't big big bulky like not bulky it wasn't worsted weight and it was on a tiny hook because you don't want the stuffing to show through and that was not enjoyable to do but this is super enjoyable this is my comfortable crochet hook and needle size like three millimeters is just like perfect so anyway so uh, I saw a lot of people using that sh like sheep's whirlet and sheep's whirl for shawls and they have a blue gradient which sadly I had already used the one I'm using is blueberry bam bam I used it in my Sophie's universe like Sophie's dream blanket I made three squares out of the gradient it goes from like dark blue to white or white to dark blue depending on which center of the cake you pull through and usually I don't like buying the same yarn twice I have this thing where I'm just like wanting to try as many yarn qualities and as many yarn colors in my lifetime like I wouldn't want to buy the color putty twice I'd want to buy like putty and then marzipan and then off-white you know from the same brand I just don't want to buy the same color twice but uh, the prompt said blue and even though Whirl had some gradients that were like blue to green or blue to purple, I was too terrified of being disqualified for not understanding the assignments. So I went with safe, I went with absolute blue. So the pattern is called the Everblue Shawl. And it came on my Ravelry recommended because there's a knit along going on. It was released as the Evergreen Shawl some time ago. And they were kits because they released a special color of Whirl, a green color that was only available for, pe for people who would do that pattern. Uh, and then they're kind of relaunching the pattern now without the special green yarn. They're calling it the Ever Blue Shawl, so people are using that gradient, the Blueberry Bam Bam, but you can also pick like whatever color you want. And it's a paid pattern if you want to buy it there, but it was also free if you like waited, because they're releasing it in batches on her, like her website. So there were three parts. Uh, she's just released part three. So I'm still on track for the <clears throat> deadline of the show. And yeah, it's nice to be part of a knit along. It's hel held on the Facebook group. So I'm not really participating, but I'm like watching other people's progress and then they ask questions and I can learn from the answers. I will show you the thing. So I've made a lot of <laughs> progress because it's crochet. It's like really fast. That's what I've done so far. So I hope you can see, but basically it's like, yeah, lace that gives you those like triangles. Yeah, it's really nice. This is my first time seeing it like on camera. Uh, so I've done basically four out of five repeats. So I've got just a bit like a couple more triangles basically to do. And we're just getting into like the gray before the white. So I'll get up until the gray and then there's a mosaic crochet border afterwards, which apparently takes like as long as it does to do this entire thing. So I'm, I'm saving time for the border, but it'll be exciting to do some crochet, like mosaic crochet. It like showcases a skill, I guess, and which gives me like the upper hand in the competition. I don't know. Uh, I've been enjoying this so, so much. It's really easy, really re repetitive. It's a bit tricky, like the increases on the points, like right, left, and like bottom points. But, and I'm following a chart. There are some written instructions, but there's a, a chart. And usually I would follow the written instructions, but they were giving me a headache to read because it was like so much text. And I couldn't, if you read crochet patterns, you know that there's like, it's just abbreviations, basically like single crochet, double crochet. It's like SC, DC. Whereas the knitting is just knit and purl are like 
K and P, but the rest is written text. In crochet, it's almost like even increase are like written ink. Anyway, so the written pattern was giving me a headache, so I decided to learn how to read the chart. And the chart is really easy to follow, actually. Uh, so yeah, I'll show you the progress later. Um, I don't know how I'm going to take finished object photos of that one, but it's nice to see the, the lace kind of show through even without a neutral background. Uh, it's really light, uh, really drapey. It made me want to make many more shawls, but I don't think I need that many shawls in my life. So yeah, I think I'm going to be on the lookout for any crochet garments that I could do. I know that the trick for that is to basically pick the thinnest yarn and the thinnest hook to get that crochet, to get that knitting fabric feel. I know Mel Make Stuff, again, made one top in black crochet thread that looked really good. I'll put the photo and name here because I can't remember. But I think I could maybe try that. It would be a nice way to see if I like crochet garments. Okay, the next project you've seen before, it's the Bibliophile by Alicia Plummer. It's a fingering weight sweater that I'm making with Kinross for Ply from Wade County Yarn in the colorway Scots Pine. I've just finished um, using a ball of yarn, so I've split for sleeves and yeah, I'm just working down the body. This is the neck and those are the sleeves. So yeah, it's a compound raglan, so it's quite interesting, like hopefully it will fit nicely. My gauge, my row gauge was completely off, so I took a gamble. I had to add, I think about 12, 13 rounds of plain knitting before splitting for sleeves. I haven't tried it on since I split for sleeves, actually. I was thinking of doing that now because I've just finished like that uh, kind of yarn, but still attached here at the neck. The neck, I'm doing the turtleneck version, but I stopped halfway through. Uh, put it on hold but basically I'm going to keep doing the neck for like a long time a very long time and then like fold it over uh, and it's actually made in half fisherman's rib not rib so it's going to be very squishy like I don't know if you can tell the difference between the rib and the fisherman's rib but yeah it's an enjoyable project I like working on that size needles as I said it's maybe my most comfortable one just 3.5 millimeter needles it's not working out pretty fast but I'm enjoying every stitch, especially since I finished like the raglan and the split and uh, like having to figure out like if it was going to fit me. So just like TV knitting, meetings knitting, and I am motivated by the fact that I absolutely adore this yarn and it blooms amazingly when it knits up, uh, it blooms amazingly when it's washed and becomes as soft as cashmere. This is lamb's wool. And yeah, I really don't think that there's too, too much to say about that. I might have a clip of me like trying it on, but maybe not. So um, don't hate me if this doesn't appear magically as I'm speaking. It's raining now, so I hope you can't hear that too much. The other thing about this pattern is that I might have to recalculate the sleeve decreases because, because my row gauge is so off. I might have to do some math about like how to space them out but I'll cross that bridge when I come to it because the body still has a way to go. I think hers is extra long, but I kind of like the length that I went for with my other fingering weight sweater, the daily pullover. I talked about that in previous episodes. So I think I might just copy the length that I did for that and I was very happy with it. So I'll finish the body and then I'll do the sleeves afterwards as opposed to what I usually do because the sleeves seem like a bit more of a headache. Next project is a test knit and is a sock. So you might wonder, oh, did you finish the eggs for Easter socks? No, I have not. Not even casted them on. The little guy is still very lonely, but I got chosen to do a test knit for Fiber and Fern and I'm doing the rosy socks. There's only like a couple of posts she has on her Instagram of those socks. So yeah, not much like advertised, but I got the pattern, started it, like quite later, and I finished one sock in two days. I was absolutely obsessed with it. I shared a bit of progress on Instagram. Let me show you. Ah, uh, look at that beauty. So I haven't blocked it yet, but it's on the holder. I'm using hand-dyed yarn for the roses and some Malabrigo sock yarn for the green, and then some Filcolana Arweta in marzipan for the body of the sock. So you got some rib. This is three co three stranded color work, three colors, 
two colors, two colors, two colors, three colors. There's two sections that have three colors and it's tricky that that's the first thing you encounter, but it's just five rows and afterwards it's fine, it's smooth sailing. The rose is so addictive to do because you just want to see it like appear. It's a classic like slip, slip stitch heel, classic like gusset. I did the smallest size, which is 56 stitches. I'm doing this on two millimeter needles. No, I was going to do it on two, but then I thought if I'm doing the 56 stitch like version, this might be way too tight. And I'm so glad I listened to my gut. So I am doing it on 2.25 and it's like a tad hard to pass over my heel, but once it's there, it's perfect. Like it's hugging my foot exactly how I would want it. And it almost helps to like stretch out the color work so that it lays flat as opposed to having like bulky color work. The tricky part about this as well is like when you're done with the uh, decreases here, it tells you like knit until you have X amount of centimeters away from the foot to start doing that color work. And it's kind of tricky to gauge like when do I stop here before doing the rows? But then I think it worked out great. And then uh, I tried it on and I love, I love it. So I made note of what I did. I was trying to be a really, really good knitter and I cast on, I cast on the other one like right away, which is good, but I've not made any progress since casting on the cuff. I'm also going to be playing yarn chicken with the Arweta. Once again, like this color of Arweta marzipan is the second time that I'm playing yarn chicken with it. I think it should be okay. And if not, I still have like a half swatch that I could sacrifice to get a bit of rest, like for the toe. But hopefully it doesn't come to that. But if need be, I will do that. But it's such a shame. But I'm, using, I'm happy to be using my stash. The contrast colors, like I said, are like a hand dyed yarn from Dystopic Fiber who's also a dyer in Glasgow, and then Malabrigo Sock in the color Ivy. And I just think that they're so perfect together. And with the Orweta, it just gives a very like vintage feel to this. I think I'm glad I didn't go with a pure white. I'm so happy I went with Marzipan. I don't think that it outshines like the variegation of those ones because it's kind of like heathered, but the true star of the show is that purple. This was wool that my boyfriend got me for Christmas, by the way. I think I showed it in the very first episode. It's called Advanced Deceiver, the purple. So yeah, feeling super tough with those socks. Extremely impressed at how fast I was able to make one. Now let's see if I can make the second. And then I can make the second X for Easter sock. And then I can cast on another pair. I'm so bad at making pairs of things, but, but I shall try. Okay. I think that was every work in progress and finished item. So there's just two more things to talk about. There's acquisitions and plans and then the giveaway winners. Okay, I'll talk about the plan first. So Florence from Handmade by Florence recently designed a sweater called the Sketch sweater, the Mist Sketch sweater. I'm never going to be able to say that fast. It's like a very low contrast, soft blue, white, one by one color work, uh, raglan uh, with corrugated ribbing details. It looks amazing, obviously. And I applied to testnet that and I was selected. So I'll be doing a testnet for her. I'm super excited. I absolutely love her style and aesthetic. There's a lot of projects that she talked about that I immediately put on my queue and like got yarn for. So I also was thinking that I'm kind of in an anti mohair kick, which I know you wouldn't guess, right? But I'm using this from Stash. I'm trying not to buy any more mohair. So I was thinking of substitutions. Like when I was applying for the test, she would ask like, what yarn are you thinking of using? And I said I would do a mohair free version and I probably would hold a strand of Alva, like I did for my Dartmoor, or of uh, Isagur Alpaca One, which is a lace weight alpaca like yarn that you can use as a second strand. So then when she chose me, I was like, okay, better keep my word. Let's look at options. And I came up with this color palette that was like a sage green and a white. And I also came up with one that was like an olive green and a gray. And I'll put photos on the screen of what I had come up with. And I was really hesitating between the two, but then I decided to go for the low contrast version of like the white and the sage, uh, especially because I was absolutely intrigued by that sagey color. I was like curious to see if that would suit me, because I know that olive kind of does, like dark green, but I don't know if 
sage green suits me and I want to make projects in sage green like t-shirts and like cardigans so I was supposed to buy four yarns you know like first strand of white second strand of white first strand of green second strand of green and if you've ever tried to buy four qualities of yarn in a yarn shop online it's so hard that they stock everything you need in the quantities you need in the colors that you need like at a price you're okay to pay because sometimes like for example loop london they charge a lot for yarns that you could find cheaper elsewhere so i was trying to be less picky about price because i knew it was going to be tricky to find someone that stocked a sweater quantity of like four yarn qualities and lo and behold i found one for a very reasonable price and it was the Oxford Yarn Store, which I visited once in person when I was visiting uh, Helen, if you're watching this, uh, for her graduation in summer. And I bought my Marseille sweater, like yarn, the Double Sunday by Petite Net and Sandless Garn, like by Sandless Garn in the colorway from Petite Net. Uh, and I also bought some Jameson and Smith. They have Knitting for Olive now, and then they have a lot of Isiger. So here is the yarn. I'm so happy with that. I'll show you a photo of what it looks like um, all together. I think it'll be better. They also threw in a lovely little like beginning of round marker, which I'm so happy about. It's like my first gift I'm receiving from a shop, I think, like ever. So thank you so much, Oxford Yarn Store, for that little charm that made my day. I can't wait to start this. I'm gonna swatch this weekend because I want to get started on the sweater and the test knit. I want to be a good test knitter. I'm really happy with the colors. I'm curious to see how my version is going to work up compared to the original without the mohair. A tester has already worked like all the yoke and split for sleeves. And we got the pattern like four days ago. That's wild. It also arrived the yarn like within 48 hours and it was free delivery. So totally recommend that shop. Uh, but don't buy too much because I want to keep some for myself. And then while I was there uh, and looking at all the Isiger yarn, I couldn't stop myself from buying yarn to make the Levitate wrap from my favorite things knitwear. If you've been on Instagram, again, you must have seen that Isiger came up with the Breeze collection and they asked a lot of designers to participate and, and contribute to try and hype up one of their qualities, the Isiger Trio, which is a linen blend. And my favorite things knitwear released the levitate wrap and i bought those colors that i'll put here on screen to make a dark brown version that uh, garno slicked made and showed on her instagram a lot of people are making a light gray with the color linen which by the way isiger have, have said is like out of stock now because of the popularity of their breeze collection i'm really happy for them like the uh, patterns are so 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 nice and breezy and summery and springy like the Tide Loop Tea was one that I loved as well, which also uses Trio and Alpaca 1 or 2, I think. But one thing at a time. I'm going to make the Levitate Wrap. I think it'll be super wearable for me. Like I've made my Eclair sweater from Beautiful Knitters in Eco Soft, and I love it. It's really nice and breezy and comfortable and I don't overheat in it as I do in like other sweaters. So I wear that one. I've probably worn that one the most since uh, knitting it compared to other sweaters and I'm super happy to be using EcoSoft again so it's the color 8S and then the colorway of the trio is chestnut and yeah I think a dark color wrap was going to be better for me than like all the light gray colors that other people were doing and I can't wait to wrap myself in this fluffy cloud it, like I'm really happy with this cardigan it motivated me so much to make more cardigans and I think a wrap cardigan is going to be a perfect addition because I don't have anything like that so it should work up quite fast. I think it's on 5.5 millimeter needles. So I probably will do that for this season, I'm hoping. But having said that, like I have so much like on the on the queue already and the test net is until June. So we'll see. But like I said, I'm trying to clear out all the needles, finish big projects to make room for all those new projects. So it's nice to be in the middle of a, a new wave of knitting projects on the needles. So yeah, I think that's about it. I really hope that this was not too long or rambly and that I gave the information that you like are here for and wanted to hear, that you were able to like see the objects like being showcased and everything. Let me know in the comments if there's anything that 
I didn't talk about that you want to know more about, I'm super happy to expand, but also check out the Ravelry pages for all those items, because if I didn't mention something here, chances are they're on the Ravelry project page, like sizes and needles and gauge and everything. Um, before we go, I'll quickly mention the giveaway winner. So firstly, I'll mention the pattern giveaway winner. So today's Friday, the thingy is open until Monday. So on Monday, I will draw the winner and then I will put it here, editing magic. Here's a person who won a free pattern, courtesy of me. So if that's you, can you please message me? Either like comment here on Ravelry or Instagram or my email, all those links are below. So if it's you, please contact me and we'll get in touch about how I can gift you the pattern. Congratulations. And then here's the winner for the hand-dyed skine from the Midnight Diary. So here's the winner. If that's you, then please likewise message me using one of the contact links below. And you must be in the UK to win this, so you would have you would have commented Perth on my latest podcast. So you'll have to send me your address and I will post this as soon as possible and get you that lovely yarn right up to your home. Thank you so much for, for everyone who participated in the giveaway and commented. And as always, thank you to everyone who's just like in general watching my videos and deciding to spend their precious spare time with me. I know, especially lately, there's been quite a lot of content being put out, which is amazing. I love watching knitting content as I'm knitting, but there's only so many minutes in the day and you can't watch everyone. So the fact that you're choosing to spend time here with me is really nice and makes me feel good about documenting my knits. And it's been a really great experience. So if you enjoy the content, then please consider subscribing or giving the video a like. It helps kind of building the channel and it motivates me to create more content like this. If you have any ideas for, f for future videos, like if you have requests on what you'd like to see or hear more of, I'm super open to hearing your ideas or requests. And then if you like the channel, you could also uh, recommend me or my channel to a friend or, you know, word of mouth on Instagram, sharing my posts. That also helps a lot. So. I hope that you got some good progress done on whatever you were knitting on. If you want to let me know what that was, I probably will edit this. And at the same time, I might make my swatch for the sketch sweater because I can't wait to see how those two colors work up when they're striped. Have a great rest of your day and happy knitting. Bye everyone.